thank you. Could uh, good evening, everybody. Uh, Fold your over leg. So it's it's a great pleasure for myself to welcome uh, all of you here this evening to the third lecture in the Assembly Commission series of four lectures, marking this very significant year of centenaries in twenty twenty one. Once again, we're delighted that Dr. Eamon Phoenix will be delivering tonight's lecture. For those joining us tonight for the first time, the Perspectives on series. Uh, this is, a, uh, is the initiative through which the Family Commission has agreed to mark key centenaries over the last decade. And doing so, we have been very clear about acknowledging and respecting all of the different views and perspectives that there are on these uh, major events. Therefore, for this year's significant centenaries, the Commission agreed that it was appropriate to have a series of lectures in which Eamon would explore the events of 20, or sorry, 1921 in detail. I think it's very positive indeed that the appropriate that the Assembly Commission is facilitating this opportunity for discussion on critical events from our shared history. In the previous lecture, Eamon presented the Unionist and the Loyalist perspective on the unfolding events a century ago, with particular focus on the Unionist leaderships of that time. Now, tonight, Eamon's lecture intends to cover the Nationalist and the Republican perspective of those same events in line with the Commission's endeavours to provide a balanced overview of such a critical period in our shared history. The feedback that we have had, thankfully, from uh, previous lectures has been overwhelmingly positive, I must say, and I have no doubt that Eamon will both inform and entertain us again tonight uh, to his usual high standards. So at the end of the lecture, there will be some time, hopefully, then to open the floor up for a short period of questions and comments. So during the lecture, please feel free uh, to enter any questions that you might have in the chat box, and we'll try to take a note and uh, cover some of those at the end. So without any further delay, I can I now invite Eamon to commence tonight's lecture. Eamon Phoenix. Thank you very much indeed, Mr. Speaker, Gravely Mahaga, and uh, lovely to have uh, so many people back on such a lovely evening when they have so many other distractions to look at our history a century ago really in this place. And as Speaker Maskey said, uh, a couple of weeks ago, I looked at the unionist perspective. We looked at Carson and Craig, the struggle against Home Rule, and in the end, the decision by Craig to accept six counties rather than nine with the King's Speech opening the Northern Ireland Parliament, and in a way, setting the seal on the partition of this island. Tonight, I want to look at the nationalist Republican perspectives, looking at the Home Rule background, the impact of Easter Rising, the rise of Sinn Féin, and the nationalist minority as it became um, in the North of Ireland and Northern Ireland, of course, after 1921. Uh, can I ask Nicola to throw up the first slide, please? So uh, you can see uh, the partition and the establishment of Northern Ireland, the nationalist Republican perspective, looking into the late 1920s. The uh, next slide, please. And of course, much of our focus tonight will be on this man, we Joe Devlin, Joseph Devlin, his name synonymous with Northern nationalism with the Nationalist Party in Northern Ireland after partition. He died in 1934, just as I suppose as partition was firming up, um, having opposed it, of course, all his political career, but also he, he tried to find compromises in the critical years before um, the end of the First World War. So we're going to be talking about we Joe Devlin um, and the origins of nationalism, just lingering at this slide for a moment. How did nationalism emerge really um, in the province of Ulster. Well, of course, this goes back to the emergence of the Home Rule Party, um, founded by a former orange man, Isaac Butt, in 1870 of the Home Government Association. The original Home Rule Party saw very, very limited devolution within the United Kingdom. But who was a, a lawyer who defended Fenian revolutionaries, believed that some kind of Irish self-government was essential if the whole island was to remain within the United Kingdom. And he was not a nationalist. He was really a devolutionist by 1870s. And he had the support initially of um, a section of the clergy of the established church, the Church of Ireland, who resented the uh, undermining of their position 
of the established church in Ireland by Gladstone in 1870. Now, of course, that Protestant infusion into the early home rule movement was very much uh, short lived, though there were always, as we'll see, Protestant home rulers, both as MPs and, of course, as supporters. You had, for example, the most prominent Belfast, I suppose, Protestant nationalist was the Reverend Isaac Nelson. A church in his memory still stands on the Schenkel Road, the Nelson Memorial. And Isaac Nelson, who was a supporter of the Irish National Land League, a Presbyterian minister, became Home Rule MP for Mayo um, in 1885. Uh, and of course, um, he he stands out, but there were others, you know, like Richard McGee from Lurgan, like Jeremiah Jordan from Enniskillen, like Samuel Young, who owned a distillery in Limavady, who owned Kelly Sellers in Belfast, a Presbyterian from Portaferry, County Down, who sponsored the career of Joe Devlin. And when he died in 1918, he's buried in Balmoral Cemetery. Uh, Samuel Young, if you like, was the father of the House of Commons at 96 years of age and a Protestant home ruler who insisted on attending royal occasions, which most nationalists didn't do. But of course, Joe Devlin is emerging in the strife torn sort of 1870s, 1880s. He's born in Hamill Street at the foot of the Falls Road, just west of the city centre uh, in 1871. And he attends the local ragged school, the Christian Brothers School in Barrack Street um, on the Falls Road. Can we just move to the next slide, please? A young Joseph Devlin, his first seat, of course, he won unopposed, was the safe national seat of North Kilkenny in 1902. He was scarcely 30 years of age. And of course, at that time, MPs were not pegged. MPs were not paid until 1911, and they needed the support of a party or a trade union or indeed a private income to um, endure the, the kind of costs of traveling to Westminster, staying in hotels and all of that. Um, the next slide, please. And of course, this is where Devlin came from. His parents had come to Belfast in the flotsam and jetsam after the Great Irish Famine from the Loch Shore, as they call that part of East Tyrone around Arbo, Donat Moor, um, where the people mainly fished for eels for a living. They moved to Belfast. His father was a Jarvey. They were working class, living in Hamill Street, an area which was actually composed of so much of the Victorian insanitary housing which characterized Belfast before the Second World War because of course Belfast was Ireland's only industrial city based on that great tripod of linen shipbuilding and engineering and so much else but not only that of course um, it was the shock city of the industrial revolution in this island it had grown too fast in the 1850s, 1860s, becoming a city in 1888. And of course, there was a, a huddle of streets um, in the west and north of the city and increasingly in the east for the, the newfound working classes pouring in from rural Ulster and indeed the west of Ireland. Because if you wanted a job in Fermanagh or Cavan or Leitrim um, in the 1870s, 1880s, you walked or took the train to Belfast because Belfast was the big smoke. And indeed, you even had Scottish artisans coming over to work in the new shipyard of Harland and Woods. So these are not quite back to back houses, but they're uh, little kind of um, parlor houses. Often they had a damp cellar underneath where the first arrivals in Belfast could invite their cousins from the country to join them. And of course, um, this is a city which is actually moving away from its liberal origins in the late 18th century, where the Presbyterian volunteers had built St Mary's Roman Catholic Church. This is a city now which is kind of defined by the national question in Ireland, Home Rule versus the Act of Union. Because that Home Rule Party, which was founded by Isaac Butt, the Protestant lawyer, was led, of course, by Charles Stuart Parnell, the um, Protestant landlord from uh, 1879 onwards, assisted by his Belfast Presbyterian associate, wee Joe Bigger, or rather, humpy Joe Bigger. Joseph Bigger was from the Lusk, uh, on the northern outskirts of Belfast, born into a, a, a stalwart Presbyterian family, which had been involved in the 1798 United Irishmen's Rebellion. And Joe Bigger, having been a member of the Water Board, uh, became a Protestant nationalist. And of course, he was with Parnell, the architect of obstruction of the House of Commons. The 
sort of English and Scottish MPs weren't interested in Irish matters. And so Parnell and Bigger kept the house up all night uh, by filibustering. Um, Joe Bigger was an expert at this, you know. Uh, he was a wealthy pork butcher with a business in Hercules Street, not on Royal Avenue, very wealthy man. He didn't actually sell the pork himself. Pork, of course, being the meat of the poor, but he made a fortune from it. And uh, he would go into Parliament and try to keep the House of Commons up all night in those days when the rules were so much slacker than they are today. But I do remember Dr. Ray Paisley in 1970 when he was returned to Westminster saying that he would emulate the tactics of the old Irish party and forcing Westminster to attend to his particular agenda. Well, what Bigger did was, of course, uh, he would hear them talking about drains in Staffordshire or, you know, dairy cows in Cheshire. And he would immediately rush down to the House of Commons Library and dig out one of the great blue books, the ancient inquiries into farming or drains in England. And as the debate got underway, he would stand up and in his rasping Belfast accent say, Mr. Speaker, sir, I demand the right to be heard. Well, I hope that doesn't sound like somebody else is meant to be Joe Bigger. And anyway, the response would be, um, are you sure this is pertinent to the matter at hand, Mr. Bigger? And absolutely, your worship. Uh, and he would start quoting from one of these books about ancient cattle in Cheshire. Three hours later, he was still going on. At three in the morning on one occasion, the speaker said to try to stop Bigger's oration, which was boring them into the ground. He said, the honourable member is not making himself audible to the chair. No problem, your worship. I'll go down to the front and start all over again. And in this way, Bigger and the rising star of Charles Stuart Parnell, the Protestant landowner from County Wicklow, uh, captured time for the agenda of the Irish party, which included home rule and land reform. So this was the home rule party at its height, but of course it was fractured in uh, 1890 by the, uh, the uh, O'Shea divorce scandal. Parnell was involved in a, a love affair which led to a divorce scandal with an aristocratic English woman called Catherine O'Shea. Her name was Irish, but she was English. She had been married to a Home Rule MP, Captain William O'Shea. And at the end, Parnell was brought down by his party and by the Catholic bishops and forced out of, po out of politics, leaving a shattered party for a decade, not reunited, until 1900, when John Redmond, Parnell's lieutenant, um, a prominent Irish lawyer, became the leader of a reunited Home Rule Party. Now, John Redmond was upper middle class nationalist. John Dillon, his deputy, was a surgeon from a strong nationalist background. Only Joe Devlin, who is becoming the third man in the party leadership, was aware of the slums of Belfast and of the struggles of labour for better pay and conditions. He was also aware that a, a woman's life in the Belfast Mills, life expectancy, was 37. And that so many children died under the age of three. Belfast had perhaps the highest infant mortality of any city in Ireland or the United Kingdom at this time. So Devlin's baptism of fire is on the streets of West Belfast at this time. The next slide, please. And of course, he received his early schooling at the Ragged School in Barrick Street. Um, in the 1860s, Belfast was growing so quickly, there weren't enough schools for the working classes, either Protestant or Catholic. And the churches were trying to provide the rudiments of education. On the Roman Catholic side, the bishop invited, uh, Bishop uh, Dorian invited in the Irish Christian Brothers, uh, which had been formed a few years earlier and were actually educating the urban poor uh, throughout the island. The Christian Brothers arrived in Belfast and their first school was St Mary's Christian Brothers School in Barrick Street, still going strong today as a, as a prominent grammar school. Joe Devlin attended what they call the Ragged School. And of course, the inspector's reports tell us about classes of about 200 and these were the sons of newly arrived immigrants from the Irish countryside. Uh, some of them native Irish speakers, they may not have had English until they went to school and uh, 
the inspectors also tell us in the 1860s about the soldier-like discipline of the Irish Christian brothers, something I can confirm because I'm a former acolyte myself. And the upshot is, of course, Joe Devlin was one of the ragged poor of those schools. Um, other prominent Belfast nationalists attended that school in Barrick Street. The old school disappeared about 1970, maybe. Um, but, for example, it was beside, it started off in a wing of the old artillery barracks, which had been there in the 18th century. And you see photographs of the old barracks. But other prominent nationalists come Republicans who attended Barrick Street included uh, Sean McEntee, uh, the son of a wealthy publican just up the street actually in, in, in um, uh, Mill Street and uh, McEntee of course was the only Belfast man sentenced to death for his part in the Easter Rising and later a uh, Sinn Féin politician, a member of the First Doyle, he had a long career as a minister in De Valera's government ending up as deputy prime minister at Thomas Jim. Another man was uh, Thomas J. Campbell, T.J. Campbell, a contemporary of Joe Devlin, was the son of a small shopkeeper on Divis Street on, in the Lower Falls. Uh, he went on to become a journalist, editor of the Irish News, a, a Casey, a King's Counsel, a senior lawyer, and eventually nationalist leader at Stormont, and a High Court judge towards the end of his life under the uh, Northern Ireland Judiciary. So it's quite amazing how many people attended poor schools, and they would have said that they were helped up not just pulling themselves up by their bootstraps, but by the um, education they received from the Irish Christian brothers, uh, men from the same kind of social stratum, albeit from rural Ireland. And there's a snapshot there of the Falls Road at the turn of the 20th century. The next one, please. Um, and of course, growing up 14, 15 years of age, Joe Devlin would have been aware of the first home ruler the first home rule bill, I should say, introduced by William Gladstone, the Liberal Prime Minister in 1885, it was defeated. Gladstone's party split. He failed to get the, the bill through the House of Commons. But of course, the House of Lords at that time had a veto over home rule. And it was overwhelmingly conservative. And the Tories were the allies of the Ulster Unionists for crown and empire. But the defeat of the home rule bill led to very serious riots on the Shankar Road. And of course, the, uh, the mainly Catholic Royal Irish Constabulary in Boris Hill Barracks and the Shankar fired into the crowd, killing uh, six men in 1886. And this is a scene of the, 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 the sort of the bloody riots, which had characterized Belfast for much of the late 19th century and would rumble on, reaching their zenith, of course, in the black days of 1920 and 1922. So Devlin was aware of tensions on the interface, the battle of the brickfields, they often called it, between the, the Falls and Springfield roads around Clonard Monastery, which was being built around the early 20th century, and the adjoining Shunk Road. And home rule divided people. In these years, of course, you would find the Protestants and Catholics, sometimes intermarrying, would move uh, deeper into the Protestant or Catholic area. But then, of course, come the Troubles, they would be expelled, a pattern which was established early on in Ireland's only industrial city, Belfast. Um, and it's worth reflecting here, of course, just as the, the RUC became unpopular with the nationalist population, the RIC were very unpopular with the unionist population from the 1880s onwards. The next slide, please. 30 people died in those riots. Now, one of Joseph Devlin's career, he became involved, he left school, of course, um, uh, age 12, uh, to become a pot boy in a local public house, Kelly Sellers, where his employer, Samuel Young, Protestant nationalist MP for County Cavan, um, if you like, recognised Devlin's talent. He encouraged him, a schoolmaster in a nearby national school in Bank Street, beside the bar, he used to bring him in at lunchtime, give him coaching in, in history and politics and literature. And soon Devlin became manager of, Ke of Kelly's, um, earning the long-term sobriquet, the bottle washer. Uh, among his political opponents, but he went on to become a journalist on the Freeman's Journal, a major nationalist newspaper which had been founded by the, the Brooke family, actually Anglo-Irish family, one of whose descendants to this day is Peter Brooke, former Secretary of State uh, of Northern Ireland. I remember him at a dinner he threw in 1991 um, in uh, Hillsborough Castle. 
uh, proudly recalling that his family had founded the Freeman's Journal, which became, of course, a home rule newspaper. By the turn of the century, Joe Devlin had been involved in the um, Sexton Debating Society in St Mary's Hall, where you had a small group of um, nationalist orators, journalists, young lawyers, and so on. In those days, you didn't need a, a degree to become a, a solicitor or a barrister. You could actually um, uh, study, um, particularly if you were a journalist at night for the law, and many of them did this. Devlin didn't, but he became a journalist and he was now a prominent figure in the Home Rule Movement. Of course, the Home Rule Movement was split. You had the, uh, the Parnellites led by John Redmond, who were a minority. You had, of course, the anti-Parnellites led by John Dillon, who had hounded Parnell out of public life. And Joe Devlin had taken the anti-Parnellite side, but he had fought another battle, really, in the 1890s, because in Belfast, the local Catholic bishop was a man called Henry Henry. It's easy to remember his name. He was from um, uh, North Antrim, and uh, he was a former president of St. Malachy's College, the um, diocesan seminary for middle class Catholics at that time, uh, and for the training of priests. And Henry regarded himself as the leader of the Belfast Catholics. And he resented the uh, interference of the Home Rule Party in Belfast. He set up his own Catholic party called the Catholic Association. And uh, he wanted to do business with the British government and with the Unionists. And there was tensions right away between this sectarian political machine headed by the bishop and a number of priests who would nominate candidates, usually wealthy publicans, for council wards. The bishop secured two Catholic wards in the city. Falls, which was basically the lower and middle Falls Road. The Falls hadn't extended to Anderson Town at that time. It was still stopped about the Falls Park. And of course, uh, Smithfield, which was the the, the kind of West Belfast part of the city centre, and they returned eight nationalist councillors. The bishop refused to share his um, voter data with the uh, either wing of the nationalist party, earning the undying hostility of Wejo Devlin, who was then, of course, in his early 20s. Uh, the bishop captured control of the Irish News, which had been formed out of the Parnell split in the 1890s. And of course, Devlin set up his own newspaper, the Northern Star, echoing the title of the United Irish newspaper in this city in 1792. Eventually, of course, um, Devlin was to defeat the bishop politically, again in control of the Irish News in 1905. By the turn of the 20th century, Joe Devlin was a nationalist MP for Kilkenny, and he was seen really as the coming man he was a small man with a mane of dark hair, dapper dresser, um, and of course, a powerful orator. William Jennings Bryan, who was a candidate for the US presidency in the early 20th century for the Democrats, said he heard Joe Devlin speak in New York, and he was the finest outdoor orator he had ever heard. Lloyd George, no mean orator himself, also paid tribute to Joe Devlin. And he was a sort of a cheeky figure in early days of the House of Commons. Um, he, he joked his unionist opponents, with whom he got on very well in the smoking rooms. This was the thing about Joe Devlin, you know, like all politicians, you know, things are never quite what they seem. Um, and of course, Devlin said, the difference between you and me, he said to a unionist opponent, is when I get up to speak, my enemy is rushing. When you get up, your friends rush out. And on another occasion, he was, he was proposing a vote for the Irish language. Now, Joe Devlin had absolutely no Irish. So he was proposing a vote uh, to support the Gaelic League, which had both Catholic and Protestants as members in that fallow period before uh, the Easter Rising. And um, a Unionist MP got up and said, have you any Irish, Joe? He says, so he says can you speak Irish, Joe? He says, better than you can speak English. This was typical cheeky, I suppose, Joe Devlin. He reminds us of Jerry Fitt in this early phase, which reminds me of a joke, but I mustn't tell too many, about Paisley, uh, Dr. Paisley and Jerry Fitt uh, waiting for a plane uh, when they were both MPs in the early 1970s. And they usually flew back every night to their constituencies. But on this night, there were insufficient seats. And Dr. Paisley got on and took a seat in the business class. And uh, Joe Devlin, uh, Joe Devlin, Jerry Fitt found that he couldn't actually get a seat. And he protested. He said, I have to get back to my constituents. And the captain said, well, apparently, well, you know, Mr. Fitt, 
the only seat we have is in with the captain. Um, and he said, wouldn't be very comfortable. Oh, not at all, not at all. I'll go in there. Can I smoke? Yeah, I'll go in there. So Jerry Fitt went in with the captain. The plane took off. Oh, somewhere over the Irish Sea, Jerry had a call of nature and got up to move down the plane. Dr. Paisley saw Mr. Fitt coming out of the cockpit and he was horrified. Jerry Fitt said, don't worry, don't worry about it. I left it in automatic. However, that's nothing to do with this. But Devlin was often compared with Jerry Fitt. He was seen as the member for Belfast because deputations from the shipyard, um, unionist working men would often seek Devlin out. He spoke their lingo. He would bring them for tea on the terrace. He would listen to their uh, concerns. He would reflect them in the House of Commons. And this was well known. Um, the problem was he had a Southern seat and he didn't really have Belfast. And it was during these years that Devlin began to look at the nationalist map of Ulster. In the nine counties of Ulster, the nationalists were about 44% of the population. They had been a majority until 1851, and then that had fallen with urbanization and emigration from counties like Donegal. So um, Devlin decided that because of the divisions of the past, now that the Home Rule Party had been united under Redmond, and they were all cooperating, um, he would need to find an organization which unified the Catholics of the North. And he found um, an organization ready to be taken over. And this was the ancient order of Hibernians, which had emerged from the defenders of the 18th century, a Catholic secret society. And it became the ribbon men at the Battle of Dolly's Bray with the Orange Party in 1849. It had been suppressed largely by the Catholic Church uh, as a secret society. But Devlin relaunched it in 1904, making himself national president and bringing it within the fold of the Home Rule Party. Soon the Hibernians, who had green sashes instead of orange ones, who had their marching days, the 17th of March and the 15th of August, who had their heroes, Patrick Sarsfield, um, William's opponent at the Siege of Ockram, um, and various other figures. Um, Devlin, uh, of course, saw this as a powerful personal power base, um, and it spread throughout Ireland and indeed into Scotland. Uh, during this period, and it became one of the main supports of the Home Rule movement in the North, more powerful even than the Home Rule Party itself, giving Devlin tremendous leverage within the Home Rule movement. Can we move on to the next one, please? And of course, there was another nationalist tradition developing in Belfast in these years, which would be, um, become important after 1916, and this was separatism or Irish Republicanism. Now, of course, the IRB, the Irish Republican Brotherhood, had been formed in 1858, seeking an Irish Republic by force if necessary. In Belfast, a man who fostered this kind of separatism was this Protestant lawyer, Francis Joseph Bigger. He was a cousin of Joe Bigger, the filibusterer. Bigger was a, a wealthy lawyer, and uh, uh, if you like, um, his family had made a lot of money in trade on both sides of the Irish Sea. He lived in a mansion on the Antrim Road called Ardui, and he gathered round him a group of young uh, poets, writers, professionals, um, Gaelic leaguers, and Bigger was involved in the Gaelic League. He was an Irish speaker. Uh, he founded the Ulster Literary Theatre as a kind of a, a northern equivalent of the Abbey. As a, as, as a platform for Irish nationalism. And it was really in his home on the Antrim Road where Roger Casement was a regular house, house guest as a consul in leave and then as the leading member of the Irish Volunteers. It was in his house that the 1916 Rising you could say was largely being planned in these years. So Bigger would die in his bed in 1926. He's buried in Malaska in the family graveyard. But he represented a small but significant uh, hiding off of nationalism, uh, drawing young men from both backgrounds, people like Ernest Blythe, an Ulster Protestant, Bulmer Hobson, a Belfast Quaker, Dennis McCullough, a Belfast Catholic, Sean McDermott from the west of Ireland working in Belfast, and they would soon become the Young Turks in the road to 1916 afterwards. Moving on, please. Now, of course, this is a comedy cartoon because as some of the politicians in the room may regret or, or, or rejoice, um, there was a time 
when you voted early and often in Belfast elections, I can remember that as a, as a young polling clerk uh, in a Belfast constituency in 1973, where the entire register was almost voted by 10 o'clock in the morning. Um, impersonation was the name of the game. But Joe Devlin wanted to win West Belfast. Belfast had four seats. West Belfast was known until the 60s as the cockpit, almost evenly split between the two communities. Uh, there were very few floating voters between the Falls and the Shankill. And in the election of 1906, not only was Joe Devlin and his opponent relying on the dead vote, and um, Joe, in fact, uh, the last trumpet call here, Rising the Dead of Milton Cemetery in this Unionist cartoon, I would have to say, Joe's last call. <laughs> but on the other hand, of course, um, he was helped by the fact that F.J. Bigger, the man in the kilt you saw in the previous cartoon, ran his own candidate as an independent in that election. And the man he ran was the Deputy Managing Director of Harland and Wood, Alexander Carlyle, a Protestant home ruler who disguised himself as an independent and bigger placard of the Shankill with vote Carlisle posters. Carlisle won 150 votes. Devlin won West Belfast by 16 votes in 1906. And the story is told as two old ladies were leaving the Crumlin Road courthouse in a sad, de decrepit condition today. But that's where, the, um, that's where the count was made. One old lady, we'll call them Minnie and Maggie, were leaving the count. And they were both Devlinites. And Minnie said to Maggie, Ah, Maggie, wouldn't you love to have been one of them 16 voters? You see, sure many, I was all 16. Those were the days. The next vote, please. The next slide, even. And of course, Joe Devlin becomes a rising star. He's soon um, secretary of the main home rule organization, the United Irish League. And he's seen by the older men now heading for their 60s. John Redmond, the leader. John Dillon, the deputy leader as the coming man. If Ireland is to achieve home rule in the early 20th century, then they see we Joe Devlin, who had a tremendous flair for organization and platform oratory, as the potential prime minister in a Dublin parliament on college green, as they always said. This is, um, he becomes indispensable to Redmond, going on fundraising tours uh, to America with him in 1910. You can see him on the platform, we Joe on the right, along with Redmond, his wife, and some Irish American dignitaries. So Devlin is now very much on his way. The next slide, please. And of course, this is the IRB revival, which involves people like F.J. Bigger, uh, Bulmer Hobson on the left, Dennis McCullough on the right. Um, they will soon fall under the influence of Tom Clark, the Dungannon reared Fenian, who had spent 25 years in English prisons and has come back to Ireland in 1908 to plan a rising. And of course, the revival in the North, which occurs in the same year that James Craig founded the Ulster Unionist Council, gives a sense of the tapestry of political tendencies in the city of Belfast. Because remember, Belfast is a city with a 25% Catholic minority, mainly in the West, um, largely Protestant city with a vast urban class. Most industries, though, in local hands, in local unionist hands. Um, the exception, of course, being Lord Perry, the managing director of Holland and Wolf, was a Protestant home ruler at this stage. The next one, please. And of course, everything is transformed by the events of 1910 to 1914. In 1910, the Liberal government, which had been in power with a large majority, produces a hung parliament in two elections. The Liberal budget has been rejected by the Tory House of Lords. And Asquith, the Prime Minister, and Lord George, the Chancellor, are determined to get their budget through. And so they cut a deal with John Redmond and his 80 Home Rule MPs. If Redmond will back the Liberals' reform programme and the Liberal budget, the Liberals will make Home Rule a primary object of their platform. And they will also remove the veto of the House of Lords, um, reducing it to a, a temporary veto of two years. That happens. Home rule is bound to become law after 1910. It's supported by the Liberals, the Irish Nationalists, the 40 Labour MPs, and that amounts to a majority. So the Conservatives who see home rule as a disaster for the empire and their Ulster Unionist allies are in a minority. And that dictates the pace. The real pressures, as we heard two weeks ago when we looked at unionism, will come from outside Parliament. Unionism has found its, um, its certain defender, or perhaps uncertain defender, 
in the Southern Unionist, Edward Carson, a man who hopes to use Ulster to defeat Home Rule completely. You have the Covenant, the rise of the UVF, and of course all of this sets an example for Irish nationalism, as the first Home Rule Bill is introduced on the House of Commons by Asquith in a 20 minute speech in April 1912. The Home Rule Party is now within sight of its promised land. The next one, please. And here we have, of course, just a snapshot because, of course, Carson had reignited the Fenian flame of revolutionary nationalism. He didn't intend to. Um, the agenda of unionism was set by the Ulsterman, James, James Craig, his finger very much on the orange pulse. Craig had built up his career from his return from the Boer War in galvanizing the orange lodges and the unionist clubs against home rule. And of course, um, therefore he was seen as the, the organizer of unionist resistance. But of course, that would lead to the Ulster Volunteers, the Lyon gun running, the importation of German guns. And of course, that would bring Ireland to the brink of civil war by 1914. Because where the North had, had gone, the South was going to follow. And of course, the IRB began to reap the opportunities which Ulster presented. In 1913, the Northern born cultural nationalist Owen McNeill, born plain John McNeill over his father's grocer shop in Glen Arm in County Antrim. McNeill had gone to St. Matthew's College, gone to Dublin, become a law clerk, and then an historian of medieval Ireland. And then, of course, co founder of the Gaelic League. And McNeill wrote an article in the Gaelic League journal on Clive Sullish. The Sword of Light, which is a legend, of course, to Mount Loch Ness, praising Carson's army. He called it the North Began, and he said, where well, the North Began, the South must finish. And he adulated Carson and the Ulster Volunteers as, if you like, taking the first important step towards Irish independence. Now, this would have amazed Carson had he read the article, but the IRB read it, and almost immediately, McNeil was under pressure to form an Irish volunteer force. He did that in November 1913. By 1914, there were 200,000 Irish volunteers, 90,000 Ulster volunteers, and of course a clash or an exchange of shots in Dungannon or in, you know, um, Balahi could have sparked off a civil war in Ireland generally. Here you have John Redmond, who took control of the volunteers, and Joe Devlin on his left reviewing the Irish volunteers in the Phoenix Park in 1915. By then, of course, the Great War had broken out and Devlin had joined Redmond in supporting the British war effort. Um, Devlin uh, brought Redmond to Belfast in October 1914 as the war entered its third month to address a great recruiting uh, meeting in the Clonald Cinema. James Connolly's daughter had just visited her father in Dublin Connolly was based in Belfast, a socialist, Republican, trade union agitator, you might say. And as Nora Connolly walked up the Falls Road to the home uh, up at uh, Glenelina, opposite the city cemetery, she was amazed by the number of union jacks at the, at the Hibernian Club uh, near Clonard Monastery, the whole way up the road. She stopped somebody and said, what's going on? And they said, oh, well, we're just getting the road ready for Mr. Redmond. He's coming to address a recruiting rally at the weekend. And of course, at that rally, uh, Redmond and Devlin encouraged Irish men to go wherever the firing line extended. But a thousand Belfast Catholics joined the Connacht Rangers, uh, whereas young men from the Shankill were joining the 36th Ulster Division, the UVF in military uniform. The same army, but different aspirations. The Unionists fighting against Home Rule and for the Empire, the Nationalists fighting for Home Rule, and the freedom of small nations. And of course, by now you had a party truce, Hibernian and orange bands regaling men going to war from both traditions and towns like Dungannon and Cookstown, the RIC reporting that this was an amazing change after the near civil war hysteria of 1913 and 1914. And of course, the problem was that during this period, the focus was now on the exclusion of certain Ulster counties from Home Rule. Redmond had rejected partition completely as a blasphemy, he said in 1913. But inexorably, Redmond and Devlin were forced to consider, first of all, county option, 
giving counties a right to vote out of home rule, which might have produced since Newry and Derry, London, Derry were given separate plebiscites, a three and a half county area, which might have become Northern Ireland with or without a parliament by 1914. Um, but of course, Carson rejected temporary partition. And Bono Law wrote to Carson saying that six counties could not be justified. They could only get four. Carson was beginning to settle on what he called the six plantation counties. And of course, nothing was agreed. The Buckingham Palace Conference, I met um, Prince Charles at the City Hall last week and His Royal Highness was discussing history with six historians. In the course of that, uh, he recalled I'm not telling any tales out at school, but he recalled my grandfather, who had called the Buckingham Palace Conference in July 1914 in the last days of peace to try to avert civil war in Ireland, even before he made that conciliatory speech, that grandiloquent gesture in Belfast City Hall in 1914. That's how bad things were. And of course, the dreary steeples of Fermanagh and Tyrone were emerging from the mists and casting those long shadows that would dictate the insolubility it seemed of the feud by the early 1920s. The next slide please. And of course we come to 1916, that bolt from the blue, the IRB had been planning a rising, that house guest of FJ Bigger on the Antrim Road, um, uh, Sir Roger Casement had left Ireland for the neutral United States, had traveled from New York to Berlin to seek arms and men for a rising. Um, England's difficulty, Thomas J. Clarke said, must be Ireland's opportunity. Of course, British naval intelligence had tracked Casement's movements, had tracked the, the armed ship uh, disguised as a Norwegian trading vessel, the Ad, on its way back to Ireland. If you want to see the gun of Roger Casement's submarine, you have to go to Bangor County Down, and in that unlikely location in Ward Park, as I saw just the other day, you'll see the gun of the U-19 which was last seen with Roger Casement photographed uh, sitting or standing against the gun on the Atlantic Ocean in 1916. Of course, Casement was arrested on Holy, on Good Friday, 1916. The guns were lost when the German crew scuttled the ship in deep water at the entrance to Cork Harbour. Casement was a prisoner in the tar by the time 130 volunteers from Belfast had met at Coal Island here in St. Patrick's Hall in County Tyrone, had mobilised, led by Dennis McCullough, and they had advanced on that hall to join up with the Tyrone and South Derry volunteers. And the aim was to follow a harebrained scheme drawn up by Pearson Connolly. They would march to Inniskinnan, cross the Aaron, cross the Shannon, and take part in the rising of Galway. No shot must be fired in Ulster, uh, James Connolly told the Northern Volunteers, because he knew Belfast and he knew the sectarian tensions and he feared that any insurrection in the North could lead to a sectarian civil war. In the end, the Tyrone Volunteers refused to march. The Belfast men were sent home to await internment, really, after the Easter Rising. Dublin held for a week. The uh, insurgent leaders executed 15 of them. Of course, public opinion was transformed. Um, uh, a few unknown men shot in a barrack yard, as one military officer wrote, had changed the nation. The next slide, please. So all of this, of course, Pierce's surrender to General Lowe on Saturday, the uh, 29th of April, 1916, ended the rising. About 450 people, mainly civilians, killed in Dublin. Um, so many unionists witnessed the rising, as well as nationalists, including a member of the UVF who watched it from the Gresham Hotel. T.J. Campbell, um, a young, well, not young, he was now 40, Belfast barrister, um, based in the Four Courts, describes the rising in his diary. He would later become a nationalist MP, and later again, a High Court judge, nationalist MP for the Falls Road in the 1930s. Um, so the Easter Rising changing everything in the North, the UVF are mobilized. And of course, the Irish volunteers condemn the rising, and Joe Devlin condemns the rising as well. But Devlin realizes that this is the danger point for the Home Rule Party which had been making the running. Home rule is now on the statute book, placed there in September 1914, but it's suspended for the duration of the war. 
Britain has bigger fish to fry than the Irish or Moon in, in the war to end all wars, as men are dying in their tens of thousands, indeed in their hundreds of thousands, in the Western Front, not least Ulster men at the Battle of the Somme in July 1916. And of course, as the executions occur, following court martials in Kilmain and jail, um, Joe Devlin writes um, to his friend John Dillon, if the government had intended to add to our difficulties, they could not have selected a better means or a better time to carry out that object. The amazing thing to me is that everybody in Ireland has not been driven into the Sinn Féin movement. No. Devlin, Dillon, and Redmond realized that if they didn't rescue Home Rule from this chaos in the burning streets of Dublin, the Home Rule party would be eclipsed by this rising movement called Sinn Féin, the name invented by the British press and the British government to describe the insurrection. And soon a new Sinn Féin party replacing the failed party of Arthur Griffith is emerging phoenix-like from the ashes of the GPO. The next slide, please. And this, of course, the senior surviving commander, whose execution was cancelled because the British government's policy had changed, not because he was an American citizen. People will always tell you at school anyway, when you're doing history, that De Valera was saved because he was a 34-year-old uh, American citizen. No, his family tried that card and they failed. He was not executed because he was one of uh, 90 men who had been sentenced to death and only 15 of the executions were carried out when under pressure from the Home Rule leaders, Asquith intervened and stared the hand of General Maxwell, the British general who had carte blanche to suppress the rising in Dublin. All of Ireland was under military law, by the way, and the Irish volunteers in the West and the UVF in the North were being used as auxiliaries to root out all seditious persons. Um, so concerned with the government about this wicked German plot, I'm quoting John Redmond. So De Valera, of course, um, interesting, but just reflecting him for a moment, unknown virtually, outside volunteer circles onto the rising, born in New York to a, uh, an Irish mother and a Spanish father, unusually sent home by his mother at the age of two, when apparently his father died, he certainly disappeared to be reared in a laborer's cottage uh, in County Limerick. A bright scholarship boy, he would become a mathematics teacher. And of course, he would say in old age that he entered politics. He joined the Irish volunteers because of the threat of the partition of Ireland. Partition, he said, was the first thing in my mind. And he said, Irish unity in a long political career was always the first thing in my mind. That's interesting, really because de Valera was always a pragmatist on the north. Um, principled non-recognition of Northern Ireland after 1921, um, so he didn't recognize it as, he, as in his 1937 constitution, articles two and three, but practical recognition, because even the constitution recognized that the Irish government could not exercise authority over, over the six counties of Northern Ireland until unity had been achieved. But this is De Valera's first sortie. He will stand in West Belfast in 1918. He will stand in a Northern seat in 1921. He represents the leader of the emerging Sinn Féin movement, soon to become as president and president of the Irish volunteers. And public opinion in Ireland, particularly among the younger classes, younger age groups, is rallying now to this movement called Sinn Féin. The British government moves from a hard policy to a soft policy. It arrests over 3,000 men and women in 1916 and turns them in Frongoch, which becomes the University of Revolution in Wales. People like Collins, Dennis McCullough and others. The prisons are used as well. People like Countess Markovic and Eamon de Valera. Then it releases the younger volunteers, men like Michael Collins, women like Countess Markovic, although she was in her 40s. Um, and Collins begins to reorganize a guerrilla campaign against British rule when the opportunity is ripe. Moving on, please. And here we have the next slide, please. Um, coming up, I think, the next slide. And we can see the rising shatters the confidence of the Home Rule Party. Devlin had said, it's surprising not everybody is joining Sinn Féin. Remember Edward Carson with the top hat in the front row at Belfast City Hall was above all a British imperialist and an Irish unionist. And he found it hard to come to terms with partition. 
He had entered politics to save my own people, his mother's people in the big house in County Galway, his father's people in the professional classes in the city of Dublin. He was the MP for Dublin University, remember, until 1918. Craig is his deputy. Mm -hmm. But in 1916, there are signals coming from the Home Rule Party that they're prepared to seek a compromise on Home Rule. And Lord George, Minister of Munitions, put in charge of, if you like, uh, electrifying the war effort in this new coalition government of Liberals and Tories, which include Edward Carson, uh, eventually as Attorney General. This government, of course, put forward proposals, at least Lord George put forward proposals for uh, six county exclusion. The six counties, present Northern Ireland, will be excluded from Home Rule under direct rule from London. No storm in Parliament, sorry about that MLS, there would be no Parliament then. It would have been direct rule like Wales for Northern Ireland. Um, and it mightn't have been called Northern Ireland. And it would still be an All-Ireland Police Force, an All-Ireland Lord Lieutenant. Um, it would be a very soft border, more or less like the border between England uh, and Scotland or Wales and Scotland today. You know, they talk about the border, but until Scottish independence, it's really just an administrative line where some things are different. Um, for example, students don't pay fees um, north of the border and things like that. And they have a different COVID policy, as we know. Nonetheless, Carson and the Unionist, Carson advises the Ulster Unionist to become engaged in this discussion. Lord George does a George Mitchell. What I mean by that is he doesn't bring Carson and Redmond into the same room. That had failed in the past. He brings the Nationalists into one room, the Unionists into another, and Lord George, the, the canny Welsh attorney, the Welsh wizard, is the interlocutor. He tells each side what it wants to hear. So he persuades Redmond that partition exclusion will be temporary until a period after the war when it will all be reviewed. And that's the line Redmond and Devlin are going to try to sell to the Northern Nationalists, very concerned about any permanence, uh, any permanency of partition. For the Unionist, Carson has a letter from Lord George guaranteeing permanent exclusion. There's a problem for him, though. He's going to have to ditch the outlying 80,000 Protestants of Cavan, Monaghan and Donegal. But there's a war on. And Carson, at a meeting at the Ulster Hall in June 1920, appeals to the imperialism of the Ulster Unionist Council. He says they must fall on their swords in the lost counties to bring America into the war. That's the object of British diplomacy. Britain has to be seen doing something about the Irish question. Anyway, he says, um, we will have British rule in the north and uh, on the borders of the six counties, you will be in a better position. There would still be Irish MPs in their full strength at Westminster, something that Redmond would use to persuade the northern nations. Look, we're still there. We're still your advocates, your um, defenders uh, in London, should things go wrong in Belfast or Enniskillen. Uh, in the US. Now, this is a blow for the Northern Nationalists in Fermanagh, Tyrone, and Derry because they had expected under the previous scheme, which failed, to become part of a Home Rule Ireland. Moving on, please. Next slide. And here we have, of course, St Mary's Hall, a bleak hall at the back of the city centre. This is the meeting place for you know everybody from Isaac Buck to Parnell to Eamon de Valera met in that old hall, hall now waste ground opposite Kelly Sellers, oddly enough, beside the the Unionist Reform Club, as it was then, of course, it's not a very broad-based club today, uh, where Carson and Craig had lunch on so many occasions at crisis moments in this, in this period. And it was to that hall that Redmond, John Dillon and Joe Devlin went to greet, if you like, um, 700 nationalist delegates from across the north of Ireland. Remember, there's no Northern Ireland yet. Uh, they'd come by train from South Fermanagh, from the bog side, from South Armagh, and they were very much bitterly divided. Most of the Ulster bishops opposed exclusion as handing the initiative to Carson. Uh, west of the van, a group of solicitors in the Fermanagh and Tyrone had rebelled against the party. And they declared, led by a man called F.J. O'Connor in Oma, his son was a later nationalist MP and magistrate, uh, uh, Roddy O'Connor, um, they argued that uh, exclusion meant um, that a Carsonite regime an orange parliament, to quote them, would be set up in Belfast. 
It was a very fractious meeting. The nationalists were bitterly divided. Devlin had tried to pack the meeting with his Hibernian stalwarts. There were a lot of clergymen present, monsignors, parish priests, most of whom were ferociously in favour of Redmond. Redmond threatened to resign if the Northern Nationalists didn't accept the Lord George proposals uh, on partition and argued it was only temporary. But it took a stentorian display of oratory from Joe Devlin to carry the day. But the nationalists were bitterly divided. They carried the proposals by a two to one majority in that bleak hall on a day known as Black Friday, the 23rd of June, 1916. Oddly enough, Brexit Day a few years later. The next slide, please. Quite a few years later. The next slide, please. This is Dylan and um, Tallman, the tall surgeon, and John Redmond uh, making their way to that meeting from London. The next slide, please. A telegram should have worried Joe Devlin. He received that night in his club in Berry Street, the National Club. Congratulations on your splendid victory for Ireland, Lloyd George. The next slide, please. That split the Northern Nationalists, that conference. Um, it became a permanent split. East-West politicians in the room, political analysts, will always have wondered about that East-West split. Uh, West of the ban has always been different in nationalist terms. It goes back to the Belfast Conference of 1916, when the majority of nationalists west of the band rejected partition, whereas those in Devlin's orbit at Belfast, Antrim, Down, North Armagh, tended to vote pragmatically for a solution they thought would only be temporary and lead to a united Ireland. This gave Eamon de Valera and the growing Sinn Féin movement a major fillip. Sinn Féin were winning by-elections, de Valera won uh, Clare, um, the seat, uh, the vacancy created by the death of Redmond's brother, Major Willie Redmond, in the Great War. And of course, you can see the words of the emerging Irish national anthem, Soldiers Are We, funny story there. I met, uh, I met a, 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 a late SDLP councillor, Newton Abbey, who was very friendly with a late um, Ulster Unionist mayor in County Antrim. And they hadn't met at this good relations event about 10 years ago, they met and they burst into song and they began to sing Soldiers Are We, horrifying certainly the Unionists present. And then they told us the story that during the Second World War at the Bridge of Arnhem, they had been very small men in the British Army and their, their, their anthem, these, these friends from different political stables, was Soldiers Are We. But it became, of course, the Sinn Féin anthem. Sinn Féin now seeking a republic and uniting the moderates led by Griffith and the more um, um, spirited Republicans led by de Valera and the young Michael Collins. Of course, the German, the, the, the conscription crisis of 1918, everything that happened afterwards would play into their hands because that scheme voted on in Belfast by Carson and by Redmond collapsed. Why? Because the Southern Unions, Carson's own people claimed they had been left out of the loop. They protested and the uh, conservative backbenchers rejected the scheme. And so because of the Southern Unionists, 10% in the other three provinces, the scheme collapsed. Carson felt a lot of sympathy for Redmond, who was fatally damaged. Carson's judgment was also questioned. He began to lose that kind of iron grip he had over unionism. As James Craig began to come into his own as the Home Rule Party, with their fading mandate at Westminster, the Ritty MPs, began to be challenged by Sinn Féin, which was winning by-election after by-election, a war of attrition against the moderate home rulers. The war going on, the sacrifice, of course, of men on the Western Front, now not valued in nationalist Ireland, which saw Easter week as the real blood sacrifice. But of course, in the North, as we said last time, in Protestant Ulster, the sacrifice at the Battle of the Somme was seen as Ulster's blood sacrifice. The next one, please. The Irish Convention sat in 1970 and 18. Carson told the Unionists to attend. You had three main groups, the Nationalists led by Redmond, the Southern Unionists led by Lord Middleton, the Ulster Unionists led by um, Hugh, uh, a man called Hugh Barry, a Korean businessman. In the end, of course, the Southern Unionists, the Redmondites formed a deal offering Irish Protestants 40% of the seats in the Home Rule Parliament. From no guarantees for unionism, you now have this amazing offer. Okay, you can have 40% of the seats, which would have meant that unionists would have been part of every Irish government under home rule. Um, while the Southern Unionists saw this as a, 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 a much better option than partition and abandonment, 
the Ulster Union has hung back. They still demanded exclusion for the whole province. Um, some wanted exclusion for the six counties. And eventually the convention, Redmond died in its last months, a broken man failing to reconcile North and South. Uh, the convention had succeeded in bring, bringing America, keeping America in the war, a piece of transatlantic window dressing. The Home Rule Party was now doomed. The next slide, please. It was doomed by the conscription crisis, threatened conscription, and then dropped. The Ulster Unionists feared conscription as well. If the Nationalists didn't go and they went, their numbers in Ulster would be diminished, followed by the German plot when it was a fake German plot mooted by Lord French, the, the Viceroy, and eventually. Moving on, please. The 1918 election would see Sinn Féin sweep the polls in Nationalist Ireland. But in the north, there had been a redistribution of seats. In the British Isles, more seats were given to cities like Liverpool, Dublin and Belfast. And so from four seats in Belfast, Belfast moved to 10 seats. Nine of those were unionists. There was a much more viable area for partition. And in that election, Carson moved north to Belfast, Dunkirk, pragmatically recognising that partition was not inevitable. It was the demand of his supporters, if not his personal preference. And of course, Joe Devlin would see his party devastated in the South. 23 Sinn Feiners were turned on a post, Sinn Féin winning 65% of the vote outside the six counties in what became the Irish Free State um, three years later. Uh, a pact between the Nationalists and Sinn Féin secured um, uh, six seats in Ulster, one in Liverpool, P.P. O'Connor, the first film centre, personal friend of Lloyd George, kept his Liverpool, um, if you like, uh, Scotland constituency, and Devlin and that handful of nationalists were all who represented Ireland in the House of Commons. Moving on, Sinn Féin established Doyle Aaron, declared a republic, and on the same day, uh, next slide please, the Irish War of Independence erupted. Cardinal Logue, the man who brokered the deal between um, Home Rule and Sinn Féin in that 1918 election. The next slide, please. And of course, uh, bishops very prominent. It's Cardinal uh, Bishop McCrory, later Cardinal McCrory, bishop in Belfast, urging uh, Belfast nationalists to vote Sinn Féin outside Falls, where Joe Devlin, a popular figure, a populist figure, the darling of the mill girls, was certain to be elected in that overwhelmingly Catholic seat of Falls, no longer the the cockpit of West Belfast, Ormo was a seat, Don Cairn was a seat, you know, Victoria was a seat in this strange election of 1918. A liberal, um, the old sort of liberal nationalist majority at Westminster was replaced by a coalition headed by Lord George, who had been Prime Minister from 1916, but dominated by the Conservatives, who were going to get the best deal for their unionist allies in the North. So Carson and 23 unionists really were the conscience of uh, the Tories, and they held three ministries, junior ministries, Craig having one of them. And the next slide, please. This is, these are violent years, of course. Um, Devlin attacking Carson as never having made a, made a democratic vote in his life. Carson finding the hurly-burly burly of Belfast working class politics with an engineering strike on his hands difficult to handle after those wine and cheese parties at Trinity. And now an elderly and ill figure, still haunted by that depression, which had troubled him from boyhood. The next slide, please. And of course, we're moving in, Joe Devlin, pictured at a Waterford by-election, which Redmond's son had won. The next one, please. Um, but of course, um, the Falls Road, the Mill Girls backing Devlin. The next slide, please. A violent election, as you'll see, clashes between uh, the, the Hibernians and the Mill Girls and the Sinn Féin candidates. De Valera was in jail, and Devlin defeated him by two to one. Next slide, please. Father Rolf Flanagan, of course, representing De Valera, the Sinn Féin priest, the Sinn Féin vice president, who had once supported partition in 1916. The next slide, please. Um, there is the result. You can see that Devlin was the darling of the falls. But of course, the Irish news headline said it all. Mr. Devlin's great victory in the West. Then Ireland accepts Sinn Féin pledges. In other words, the Home Rule Party had been defeated in the South. And of course, Carson and Craig had a victory in, in the northeast of the island. The next one, please. These are years of violence. The Home Rule Party, of course, is gone. Um, the Long Committee, um, led by a chairman who was very much a, a dyed-in-the-wool Irish unionist, um, draws up a scheme for partition. They recommend nine counties for the uh, Northern Ireland Parliament. 
Um, Craig the man six, and he's in a position to dictate uh, as the partition bill goes through its stages. Devlin putting up a uh, stalwart resistance, demanding um, concessions for the North, PR, um, a weighted presence at, at, at in, the, in, the, in the Northern Ireland Senate, something that Carson demanded for the Southern Unionists. But of course, these are voted down. A very fragile Council of Ireland. Craig says he will abolish PR at the earliest opportunity, and the Act allows him, him to do so. The next one, please. It's against this background, of course, that Ireland is being partitioned. Lord George is diverted at, by the Paris Peace Conference. Violence is raging in Ireland, north and south. The Irish War of Independence, masterminded by Michael Collins. The police collapses, mainly Catholic RIC, Black and Tans, auxiliaries. The next are brought in. A reprisals policy is adopted by the British government. The next slide, please. And we can see Craig insists on a separate administration for Northeast Ulster and a new police force. The Ulster Specials are born out of the UVF, 32,000 strong, exclusively um, Protestant unionist. Um, and of course, they are now being plied along the nationalist areas in the border, Newry, South Armagh, South Fermanagh, as the IRA campaign spirals. There's a lot of bloody sectarian and political violence, especially in Belfast. Uh, 500 people die at least two years, 1920-22. The bulk of those are from the Catholic community, 60% almost. Some shocking atrocities on both sides. Devlin, of course, is raising the question of pogromists, those who drove um, eight to 9,000 Catholics out of their jobs in the shipyards and elsewhere in 1920 in uniform uh, during this period. But his is a, a solitary voice at Westminster. Um, and of course, Lloyd George's policy is to separate the North from the South so that he can deal with the South separately. Uh, the aim is to set up um, a constitutional entity called Northern Ireland under the control of the Unionists in the six counties. The next one, please. Uh, Devlin raising issues like the execution of Kevin Barry, like the reprisals policy, uh, supported by Labour, and Asquith, the former Liberal Prime Minister, the Liberal press up in arms against the reprisals, the King becoming concerned about the war in Ireland and the sheer degree of militarism, very concerned, wanting to make a speech following the new Northern Ireland elections in 1921, Kant for peace. The next one, please. And of course, um, the, the King's speech leads, marks the Unionist victory in the 1921 elections. Devlin is returned in two seats, West Belfast and indeed County Antrim. That sounds great under PR, but it reflects the bankruptcy of men. Devlin and De Valera had signed a pact, but there's bad blood between um, the Sinn Féiners and the Hibernians, and therefore they don't transfer easily. But the result shows the scale of division in the new Northern Ireland. 66% of the electors vote for Craig's Unionist Party, which wins 40 of the 52 seats. But 33% vote for Sinn Féin or the Home Rulers, the majority vote for Sinn Féin, um, and they get six seats each. They should have won probably about 15, 16 seats, but PR um, sees um, less transferring, friendly transferring than you would expect. Um, the violence is continuing. The truce of 1921, which is the, the fruit of the King's speech, enabling de Valera eventually to go to London, and his place is taken by Griffith and Collins at the treaty negotiations. Unionist fears rise as powers are not are no longer devolved, devolved to the new Northern Ireland government. Craig is suspicious of Lord George's potential treachery. The Boundary Commission becomes a factor in the negotiations and it divides not just North and South. Craig rejects the Boundary Commission as a breach of faith by the British government, endangering his six counties. But it also separates the border Catholics in Fermanagh, Tyrone and Derry from the Belfast Catholics, the Irish News wants um, nationalists to take their seats in the new parliament and seek a deal with Craig, an accommodation, whereas the border nationalists led by Cahar Healy want to get as large an area as possible into the new free state. The next one, please. We're moving into a period of violence, non-recognition of the North by um, Northern nationalists. They abstain from parliament. They take their leaf out of the Ulster Covenant quote unquote, refused to recognize the authority of that parliament. And of course, they're supported by Collins in the South. Teachers are paid from Dublin. Northern um, councils and nationalist hands declare their allegiance to the Doyle, including Fermanagh County Council, which is dissolved by the new Northern Irish government. And of course, 
Colin signs two pacts with Craig. The second one is most important. In It follows the McMahon murders, a brutal event in Belfast, uh, carried out almost certainly by uh, members of the RIC and the specials, um, which is matched shortly afterwards by the murder of Protestants in South Armagh at Bay by members of the IRA under Frank Aiken. Nonetheless, um, the Craig Colin Pact, uh, which is masterminded by Churchill, he's the minister in charge of Irish affairs, he brings Craig and Collins to London twice. And Craig goes to Dublin to meet Collins in February as well, uh, to, try, to try to end the violence, to try to uh, create a better atmosphere north and south. Um, the pact proposes an end to violence. Collins says he will stop the IRA violence. Uh, Craig says he will try to reinstate the Catholics in their jobs. Difficult because there's now a, a global recession. And there's an agreement that the specials will be, will be reformed and the Catholic special police will be raised to defend Catholic areas. This pact has enemies on both sides, the anti-treaty treaty IRA who are imposing the Belfast boycott, which had been adopted by the Doyle and is very much a sectarian measure against smaller firms and banks in Belfast. Um, and then on the other side, you have Dawson Bates, the hardline Home Affairs Minister, and key officials in the police who want to frustrate the proposals for policing reform. It's washed away in a river of blood. The next slide, please. Carol Healy, of course, is preparing the nationalist case for the Boundary Commission. He's a Sinn Féin leader in Fermanagh, almost certainly an IRA intelligence officer as well, using his uh, position as manager of the refuge insurance company covering three or four counties um, as a cover for his activities. He's interned in 1922 with 700 nationals on the Argenta prison ship as the Unionist government introduced the Special Powers Act and internment in May 1922. They then bring in the Local Government Act um, uh, in Belfast, which seeks to remove PR for local elections and put, as they put it, the natural rulers in control. The constituencies are redistributed, or should I say gerrymandered. We have a lovely letter from James Cooper, a unionist lawyer in Fermanagh saying, in 1922, I am gerrymandering by night. By 1923, uh, London Dairy Corporation, the Dairy City Council, if you like, and Fermanagh and Toronto Councils will be under unionist control. The Boundary Commission has not got uh, access to a plebiscite, so it's unlikely to make the great changes. Collins, now dead, Cahar Healy had hoped for. The next slide, please. By 1925, the Boundary Commission, uh, with representatives from North and South, although Craig refused to recognise it, under a, an Englishman who was a South African judge, Mr Justice Feetham, has reviewed the border, travelled from South Down to the banks of the foil. Um, it recommends only minor changes. The map is leaked. A large part of Donegal is to be brought into Northern Ireland to give Derry its natural hinterland. This is the Unionist area known as the Lagan Valley between Derry and Letterkenny. A large part of South Armagh centred in Cross Maglen is to go south. Apart from that, changes are minor. The Irish government are alarmed. Owen McNeill resigns, says he signed it because of the threat of civil war. The whole thing collapses and is replaced by an agreement, next slide please, signed between Dublin, Belfast and London. Um, uh, confirming the 1920 border. Joe Devlin has already taken a seat in the Belfast Parliament, captured here, as was Carson, as was Cardinal Logue, by Sir John Lavery, the Belfast uh, artist, um, who was a society artist in London in 1928. This is Joe Devlin, uh, oddly enough against the tricolour. I mean, he wasn't a Republican at all, but that's how he's captured. Devlin and Healy eventually um, reunite nationalism in 1928 as the National League. They take their seats in the new parliament, not at Stormont yet, but at the Presbyterian College in Botanic Avenue. For four years, Devlin tries to unite the nationalist 10 or 11 MPs with the handful of Labour MPs and a few independents, including Tommy Henderson, the independent unionist for Shanko, seeking the retention of PR, um, better safeguards for the minority and of course better benefits uh, widows and orphans pensions for the poor especially as the recession begins to bite after 1929. In that he gets on well with Craig personally uh, just to give you finally a letter that he writes in 1930 when James Craig is seriously ill and Joe Devlin writes to a friend in Dublin about James Craig's illness and um, 
He's alarmed, of course, that his old friend from the early 1900s is ill. And he writes, he said that, you know, poor Jimmy Craig, um, I hear it in a bad way. I'd be sorry to see him go, writes Joe Devlin in 1930, to a Dublin judge, a friend of his. Um, he and I have had many a tough fight, but he's an oath to man like myself. And I know where I am with him. Dear God, that's the trouble with them all. We can't abide them, uh, but we feel at home with them. Now, don't you be telling those fellows down south that. It's an amazing insight by Joe Devlin. Sadly, that rapport didn't produce very much. He did get 50% grants in the 1930 education bill from Craig, but the only uh, nationalist bill accepted was the Wild Birds Protection Act of 1931. Devlin leads his followers out in 1932. He dies in 34. And thereafter, abstentionism becomes a nationalist really tray, and nationalism becomes a state within a state within Northern Ireland. It's in the state, but not of it, with its own church, schools, cultural activities, newspapers, even its own hospital. And that remains the case until the impact of the 1947 Education Act in the late 1950s and the emergence of the civil rights movement in the 1960s. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you, Eamon. Thank you very, very much again um, for another really, really spellbinding um, presentation of those events at that time with all the information detail that you've provided to all of us and such an entertaining fashion as you normally do. So again, thank you very, very much for that. We have, I think, a few minutes left if, if, want to, if people want to put a few questions in, maybe Eamon will do your best to respond. Uh, one of the previous, uh, one of the, the, the audience had earlier, Thomas Gillen, I think, had actually asked a question about the extent to which some of the hostility between AOH and the Sinn Féin organisation had went uh, he listed a number of potential incidents around Devil Air himself for attacks on Cross McGlenn and so on. But I think you've covered that, but you, I, you might want to add a little bit more about that. But one of the things that I'd like to ask myself, if you don't mind, just in terms of in your early part of the conversation around the end of the 1800s, you were talking about like home rule and land reform. They were like the twin set, so to speak. But land reform fairly fell off the agenda. Um, after a while, obviously, in favor of the bigger constitutional question. Maybe, maybe at some point elaborate a little bit further on, on the issue around land reform and other social issues. Absolutely. Well, two things. First of all, Thomas, uh, Thomas's point. Uh, there was very bad blood between the Nationalists and the Hibernians. If you want to get an insight into that, read Patrick Cavan, the famous Irish poet's uh, autobiography, The Green Fool, when he describes clashes in his part of County Monaghan in the 1918 election. Hibernian halls were mysteriously burned. There were clashes at the election. The West Belfast election, the Falls election of 1918, was particularly violent, uh, with the Mill Girls, of course, throwing salt in the eyes of Sinn Féin speakers, waving Union Jack. It was a lot of very, very bad blood. And although it was patched up in a pact against partition, which the nationalists agreed with Sinn Féin meant, quote unquote, national suicide, uh, it was very hard to resolve that. And indeed, um, Republicanism doesn't really disappear. Um, after 1921, it's suppressed by the state, the Special Powers Act, um, and a, a nationalist party, uh, you know, emerges as strong. But some old Republicans like Cahar Healy on board, and people like uh, Joe Cannellan from Newry, um, and Alex Donnelly um, from OMA. But in general, uh, Republicanism remains in the shadows. And of course, the IRA um, is reformed. And in the 1930s, it's significant on the whole in, in both parts of Ireland. And of course, there's a small campaign during the war, and then there's the 50s campaign and so on. Um, and there, of course, they tend to be an abstentionist party, Sinn Féin at that stage. But you asked about that. Yes, the bad blood was very much there, but Hibernianism is important up to maybe the 1950s when it begins to decline. And by the 60s, it's certainly declining. Um, and uh, uh, it tends to be the remnant, Joe Devlin's party. Um, it uh, still has a, a big clout in the Nationalist Party under people like Senator Jerry Lennon, for example, of Armagh, uh, a Nationalist Senator, who had talks with Sir George Clark, the head of the Orange Order in 1962, the Orange and Green Talks, two members of um, opposing, if you like, um, sashed societies meet to try to discuss 
being nationalist grievances. It all breaks down, which is a pity, but that certainly is a factor. And there are lots of law cases about halls burned mysteriously um, in areas like Arbo and in Fermanagh and other areas, and in Donegal even. Um, the, the speaker uh, mentioned, of course, land reform. It was, um, it was um, James Fintan Lawler, who was a radical uh, thinker in the nationalist movement in the 1850s. And Fintan Lawler had said that uh, the land question would be the engine which would pull, pull the home rule train. And uh, with Parnell, Michael Davitt, the founder of the Irish National Land League, whose slogan was the land of Ireland for the people of Ireland in uh, 1879, and the IRB, the mountainy men, the, the, the physical force men, they form a pact in 1879 called the New Departure. And basically they said they would collaborate, led by Parnell, to achieve land reform. And they begin to campaign. They bring in, of course, the uh, weapon of the boycott. You have the famous boycott of uh, Lord Aaron's estate in Mayo with Captain Boycott, uh, the local agent. He's boycotted by businesses. He's even ignored in the street. Nobody will harvest his crops. And then orange men are sent down from the north, the famous boycott exhibition. It's a powerful weapon used across Ireland. Um, and Parnell is jailed during that period for calling on Captain moonlight these shadowy figures to uh, take, take action against landlords and then Gladstone responds with the 1881 Land Act which brings in the three F's uh, which is what the land uh, the, the, the moderate land reformers north and south have been demanding fair rents set by a court um, uh, if you like fixity of tenure if you paid your rent you could enjoy your farm without being evicted couldn't be evicted and thirdly freedom of sale you would get compensation for the improvements you made now, this is very important. And that act is built on. It's then left sitting there. It does give a great deal of security to Irish farmers. And it's an important step on the way to their ownership of their own farms. Home rule dominates the next few years. But in 1903, a Conservative government brings in Wyndham's Land Act, which uh, followed a conference of uh, nationalist politicians and landlords. And it, uh, it lets the British government buy out the landlords. So they buy out the landlords and give them um, an incentive to sell their estates, maybe 100,000 acres in the case of the Marquess of Downshire and County Down. And it, they also lend money to the small farmers, the tenant farmers, to buy their farms. And by the 1930s, every farmer in Ireland is the owner of his own farm. So I wouldn't say it was forgotten. It was Parnell, the Land League and the IRB who established that principle uh, by making Gladstone bring in the 1881 Land Act. Okay, thank you again, very informative. A couple of other questions, one from Derry Cussey actually, and Derry got how pivotal this is the perennial um, speculative one. Um, how pivotal do you think was the death of Michael Collins at the time? And then we have another one from Paul Nugent, all the way from Connecticut, who's asking, uh, could you would like to tell us a little bit more about your grandfather, who you mentioned at the start of your, your lecture? Yeah, well, two things. Um, uh, Derek will enjoy this joke. Um, uh, it was uh, the death of Michael Collins was almost as significant as the death of Friar O'Hussey in the um, 1798 rising. He and I spoke about this at a kind of a decade of centenaries event some time ago. Um, yes, indeed. I mean, Michael Collins um, had been riding many horses before and after the treaty. He was a born conspirator. So on the one hand, he was expected to implement the treaty and crush the anti-treaty IRA rebellion against the treaty. In other words, enforce the democratic will of the Irish people uh, in that election in 1922. On the other hand, of course, we know he was organising uh, our army northern divisions of the IRA from Belfast to Strabane and to, to um, South Fermanagh. And uh, he was encouraging that policy of non-recognition by um, northern nationalists at council level, teachers, other officials. Uh, and of course, he promised the northern IRA commanders on the 5th of August, 1922, um, just over two weeks before his death, that when he ended the civil war, and some people believe he went south to end the civil war that August, uh, he would then turn to the northern question. Now remember, this is a period of um, military dictators across Europe. It's the age of um, uh, Mussolini, first of all, in 1922, as dictator of Italy, uh, Hitler in Germany from um, 1933, uh, and then you have Franco in Spain from 1939, Salazar in Portugal. It wouldn't have been on you and General Pilsudski, of course, Marshal Pilsudski in Poland. 
So it would have been it wouldn't have been unusual for Michael Collins and his IRB associates, Ono Duffy, who was a Northern IRA figure, uh, essentially, and Richard Mulcahy, to establish a military dictatorship. Remember, there was a military coup attempted in Dublin in 1924 in the army mutiny. But Collins was dead. And these officers claimed that the Free State Government of Cosgrave was abandoning Collins' all-Ireland vision. So Collins was commander-in-chief. He had the, the National Army at his beck and call. Would he, could he possibly have staged a coup, ended the Civil War, and then turned to the Northern Question? It's a tantalizing possibility, and I wouldn't rule it out. Um, my grandfather, I'm not sure what I said at the beginning about my grandfather. Um, <laughs> I yeah. tell so many stories. Um, I, think uh, to, I think you were talking about Prince Charles. Ah, I was talking about Prince Charles. <laughs> no, he's not my grandfather, um, uh, I'm afraid. Um, no, but we did look across the table, masked at each other, and I thought we were pretty good from the nose up. But uh, no, um, uh, the thing about uh, my grandfather, two grandfathers I'll talk about, you're, you're, sorry you started me on this. My great-grandfather was a Presbyterian schoolmaster in Tully Lucian, County Down, uh, right during the Great Famine to the 1880s. He was a native Irish speaker. He taught Irish in Ballylock National School, which was a Presbyterian school outside Banbridge. We put a plaque up to him recently. I have his Gaelic Bible, which is the Bedell Bible. He sent his family, including my grandfather, who was killed in the First World War. So my grandfather, William Phoenix, uh, survived the Battle of the Somme. His name's on the War Memorial in Banbridge, but he was actually killed six months later. Um, but he was an Irish speaker. His sisters, who were teachers, they were all teachers, was an Irish speaker. And theirs was a mixed marriage. Uh, William Phoenix, my grandfather, was married a Catholic. Um, my other grandfather, um, was a nationalist who joined the Irish National Fusiliers. They mainly recruited men from Cavan, um, uh, Monaghan and Armagh. And uh, he served in the Great War. He served at the Dardanelles on the Western Front. He was wounded three times under the age of 20. He was demobbed in Dublin uh, in 1916, uh, in, 19, uh, in 1919. Um, and he was very frail because he'd been wounded three times and had been um, you know, his wounds have been dealt with at, uh, you know, perfunctory military stations on the fronts. Anyway, um, he was given, I haven't yet, he was given a reference by his uh, senior officer saying this man fought for his country. He should be given light work because of his wounds. So in those days, after the First World War, wounded soldiers wore kind of blue overalls, which distinguished them as having fought in the recent conflict. And that was obviously to draw the attention of the public and employers. <clears throat> so my grandfather, who was a Catholic, um, uh, had moved to Belfast and uh, like many country people looking work, and uh, he was given a job in the Belfast Rope Works. But unfortunately, on the 23rd of um, July 1920, um, sectarian tensions, um, a speech by Carson talking about they wouldn't tolerate Sinn Féin, uh, uh, thousands of Catholics were driven out of their work that day, and he was driven out of his work, but he was wearing these British Army fatigues and a crowd got around him and they began to kick him and he could have been kicked to death. And an old lady stepped out of her house on the Newton Mars Road from one of the Protestant streets. And in those days they wore sh shawls and she threw his shawl around him and said, this man died for his country and she saved his life. So you asked me to tell you stories about my grandfathers. <laughs> um, well, look, we don't have any further uh, questions. We just have a comment. I think a bit of a clarification from Paul from Connecticut. There, just about he thought you mentioned your you had mentioned your grandfather organizing some conference, maybe way back in, in the day. So, can I just explain that was uh, Prince Charles was saying that his grand his grandfather George V organized the Buckingham Palace Conference in 1914 to try to avoid civil war. So it was the prince's grandfather. I was actually name checking. So I'm sorry you had to listen to so much about my grandfathers, but there you are. <laughs> I thought that myself, but I mean, uh, I thought you're yeah, very interesting, but you're both your grandfathers, so you can see a certain amount of to say, like yourself, you didn't like it off the stones, your knowledge of all of this stuff. Um, so it's been in the family for a long while. Um, Look, I think that that fairly well brings it the, the tonight's event to a close. And uh, I think on that basis, we're, we're happy enough to let it go for tonight. The same and you said, you just have for a lovely evening tonight as well, which is good. Hope that augurs well for the next few weeks um, in the summer. So I'd like to thank everybody for attending this evening and to once again extend our deep appreciation to Eamon himself for another excellent presentation. The next lecture now is on Wednesday, the 9th of June.
2021, of course, and that's at 7 p.m. And Eamon will bring this particular series to a conclusion by covering the following 50 years with his lecture entitled uh, From Troubles Start to Welfare State and From Civil Rights to the Troubles of Stormont Parliament 1921 to 1972. So hopefully we'll see as many of you uh, back again um, for that final uh, lecture of this particular session. So if there's any other remarks, Eamon, you want to make yourself? Yeah, I'll... well, just to thank you, Mr. Speaker, for hosting it again and to thank everyone who came along this lovely evening and to thank Nicola for her help and Francis in the background. And uh, just to say I'm even more thankful to the Speaker for not for not ch chastising me for my attempted accent of Joe Bigger and uh, various speakers of Parliament because he didn't like my Daniel O'Donnell accent at all. <laughs> I laugh, sorry. <laughs> I knew, I knew, I knew Jerry fit very well actually because it was from a new lodge old myself. So <laughs> I, knew, I knew Jerry. I met him at the time on his campaign trail. So um, I was, I was kind of laughing at the, at the your characterisation of Jerry. So anyway, Eamon, again, thanks very much. Thank you very much. Thanks everybody. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye bye. Thanks again to everybody. Night night. See you why. Night night. See you why.